Part 8 of The Sunflower, the story of Simon Wiesenthal and the dying SS officer. When the order came to fall out, we leaned our rifles against the house walls and sat down and smoked. Suddenly we heard an explosion and looked up, but there was no plane in sight. Then we saw a whole block of houses which had been blown up. Many house blocks had been mined by the Russians before they retreated, and as soon as our troops entered the buildings, they blew up. One comrade declared that the Russians had learnt such tactics from the Finns. I was so glad we had been resting. We had escaped again. Suddenly a staff car stopped near us. A major climbed out and sent for our captain. Then came a number of trucks which took us to another part of the town. There the same miserable picture presented itself. In a large square we got out and looked around us. On the other side of the square there were a group of people under close guard. I assumed they were civilians who were taken out of the town in which fighting was still going on. And then the word ran through our group like wildfire. The Jews! In my young life, I had never seen many Jews. No doubt they had formerly been some, but for the most part they had emigrated when Hitler came to power. The few remained simply and dis disappeared later. It was said that they had been sent to the ghetto. Then they were forgotten. My mother sometimes mentioned our family doctor who was a Jew and for whom she mourned deeply. She carefully preserved all the, his prescriptions for she had complete trust in his medical knowledge. But one day the chemist told her that she must get her medicines prescribed by a different doctor. He was not allowed to make up the prescriptions of a Jewish doctor. My mother was furious but my father just looked at me and held his tongue. I need not tell you what the newspapers said about Jews. Later in Poland I saw Jews who were quite different from ours in Stuttgart. At the army base in Debica some Jews were still working and I often gave them something to eat, but I was stopped when a platoon leader caught me doing it. The Jews had to clean up our quarters and I often deliberately left behind on the table some food which I knew they would find. Otherwise, all I knew about Jews was what came out of the loudspeaker and what was given to us to read. We were told they were the cause of all our misfortunes. They were trying to get on top of us. They were the cause of war, poverty, hunger and unemployment. I noticed that the dying man had a warm undertone in his voice, voice as he spoke about the Jews. I had never heard such a tone in the voice of an SS man. Was he better than others, or did the voices of the SS change when they were dying? An order was given, he continued, and we marched towards the huddled mass of Jews. There were 150 of them, or perhaps 200, including many children, who stared at us with anxious eyes. A few were quietly crying. There were infants in their mother's arms, but hardly any young men, mostly women, and grey beards. As we approached, I could see the expression in their eyes. Fear, indescribable fear. Apparently, they knew what was awaiting them. A truck arrived with cans of petrol, which unloaded, and they and were taken into the house. The strong men among the Jews were ordered to carry the cans to the upper stories. They obeyed, apathetically without a will of their own, like automatons. Then we began to drive the Jews into the house. A sergeant with a whip in his hand helped any Jews who were not quick enough. There was a hail of curses and kicks. The house was not very large. It had only three stories. I would have not believed it possible to crowd them all into it, but after a few minutes there was no Jew left on the street. He was silent, and my heart started to beat violently. I could well imagine the scene. It was all too familiar. I might have been among those who were forced into the house with the petrol cans. I could feel how they must have pressed against each other. 
I could hear their frantic cries as they realised what was to be done to them. The dying Nazi went on. Then another truck came up full of more Jews and they too were crammed into the house with the others. Then the door was locked and the machine gun was posted opposite. I knew how this story would end. My own country had been occupied by the Germans for over a year and we had heard of similar happenings in Ballystock, Brodie and Grodek. The method was always the same. He could spare me the rest of his gruesome account. So I stood up ready to leave but he pleaded with me please stay i must tell you the rest i really do not know what kept me but there was something in his voice that prevented me from obeying my instinct to end the interview perhaps i wanted to hear from his own mouth in his own words the full horror of the nazis inhumanity when we were told that everything was ready, we went back a few yards and then received the command to remove the safety pins from our hand grenades and throw them through the windows of the house. Detonations followed, one after another. My God. Now he was silent and he raised himself slightly from his bed. His whole body was shivering. But he continued. We heard screams and saw flames eat their way from floor to floor. We had our rifles ready to shoot down anyone who tried to escape from the blazing hell. The screams from the house were horrible. Dense smoke poured out and choked us. His hand felt damp. He was shattered by his recollection that he broke into a sweat and I loosened my hand from his grip. But at once he groped for it again and held it tight. Please, please, he stammered, don't go away. I have more to say. I no longer had any doubts as to the ending. I saw that he was summoning up his strength for one last effort to tell me the rest of the story right to its bitter end. Behind the windows of the second floor, I saw a man with a small child in his arms. His clothes were alight. By his side stood a woman. Doubtless the mother of the child. With his free hand, the man covered the child's eyes. Then he jumped into the street. Seconds later, the mother followed. Then from the other windows fell burning bodies. We shot. Oh God. The dying man held his hand in front of his bandaged eyes as if he wanted to banish the picture from his mind. I don't know how many tried to jump out of the windows, but that one family I shall never forget. Least of all the child. It had black hair and dark eyes. He felt silent, completely exhausted. The child with the dark eyes he had described reminded me of Eli, a boy from the Lemberg ghetto, six years old, with large questioning eyes. Eyes that could not understand. Accusing eyes. Eyes that one never forgets. Well, Shabbat Shalom, Mike Fryer.